little early today just testing out everything I want to make sure uh, the video and the sound is okay just wait a couple minutes here for this class to start Uh, today's class, the topic is planting potatoes and strawberries. And I have a script today. Hello, welcome. I'm going to get started with the class now. Um, I'll just go through some reminders and some basic things before we start to give time for more people to join. Uh, but today's class, the main topic is how to plant potatoes and strawberries. I have quite a few notes right here because there's some really important key information about both of these crops that I have to make sure I remember to tell you guys. So I kind of have my notes here today, um, just making sure I hit all of those really important points so that you guys can successfully grow potatoes and strawberries this season. And if you have any questions, um, please remember to state uh, your garden zone and your state so I can accurately answer those questions. And every now and then I have to tap the screen here to open the live chat because it doesn't just stay open here with YouTube. That's just how it is. Um, but anyways, um, really quick, just um, some reminders and things going on. Uh, my live classes are very random. <laughs> it's I don't have a set schedule. It all depends on what is growing in my garden, what, what am I planting this weekend. So it's very last minute. I apologize about that. I wish I could be, you know, have a more set schedule. But I literally start telling people about it the day before because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to be doing this weekend. Um, I definitely, I just got my delivery of strawberry bare roots and my potatoes have started sprouting. So I'm like, all right, it's time for me to plant this and it's a perfect opportunity to teach you guys how to do it. Um, but the best way to get notified about upcoming classes is to join my email group. Um, I'll put a link in the description or bio after this class, uh, this video gets uploaded to my YouTube channel. And I'll put everything in there but my email people are the first to know about dates and times for any kind of classes and things like that also they're the first to know of any sales like right now I'm doing a fall um, mid-season kind of sale on everything plants seeds everything so uh, take advantage it ends at the end of this month so like two more days left so they're the first to find out about these things and they're the first to find out when things are back in stock because I have quite a few things that as soon as I put more stock on my website, they sell out within minutes. Literally, I had some tomato seeds sell out in 20 minutes since posting it. So I am a small backyard grower. I have two gardens. This is my home garden. It's the smallest of the two. The second one is on my aunt's property. She has a couple acres. So I grow more of like the bigger type crops over there. And that's also where I have my chickens and bees. <laughs> so lots of stuff going over there. Um, but yeah so if you want to be the first to know about any news updates classes sales restocks the email group is by far the best way sometimes i forget to post it post about it on all the different you know social media accounts and things that i have so email groups the best um obviously if you haven't already make sure you subscribe to my channel that way you get notified of when i go live like classes like this because like i said it's kind of random so um you know subscribe and turn on those notifications um, just so you know, I try to post new gardening tutorials every week. That's kind of like my schedule. It's like the most I can do right now with the time that I have. Um, so it tends to be every Friday. This Friday's tutorial is how to grow onions and, from seed and plant them. It's too late to start them from seed right now, but you can still transplant them. So you can go ahead and buy little transplants and plant them in your garden. So that tutorial is really awesome. Perfect timing because if you're in the south, zones eight and up like me i'm in florida zone 9b um october and november are when we plant up all of our onions so perfect timing make sure you stick around because that tutorial will explain everything you need to know about transplanting them and what do you need to do so that they grow to be nice big bulbs at harvest time and then after that <laughs> i'm going to be doing an official how to grow strawberries guide this class is going to show you some things but that guide is going to go real in depth with it that'll be coming out later this month or in november and another one on how to grow potatoes. I do have a potatoes one already, but um, there's some things that I definitely missed in that one. So I'm gonna be redoing that one. So there's lots to come out. And if you are in the South like me, then this is the same planting time, perfect timing for, for you guys. 
Um, and after this class is done, I, uh, it gets uploaded to my YouTube channel. So if you miss anything or you miss one of my classes, every class has a different topic or theme. Definitely just, you know, go to the live tab on my YouTube channel and you can rewatch it there. Also, after this class, I send a summary email so that you don't have to, like, take notes and, you know, miss things. I will just list out, you know, products I may have used, uh, where I find certain resources, the names of cultivars of things, stuff like that, because people usually ask me. So I just list it all out there. So don't worry, relax, watch this, uh, you know, class, and you'll have the list sent to you afterwards. And like I said earlier, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer any questions about gardening. You know, uh, what's going on in your garden? Is there something you're struggling with? Um, you know, are you planting something and just want to know a little bit more about that? Um, just make sure that you uh, say what state you're in and garden zone so I can answer that the best as possible. So we're going to get right into it. There's um, pretty heavy amounts of information for both of these crops. So I'm trying to cram it all in here in like an hour, hour and a half. Um, let's get started with potatoes first, and then we'll go into how to plant the strawberries. So I'm going to pick the camera up, and we're going to walk over to my potato section of my garden. I don't know if you guys can hear all that. There's like, my neighbors are like cutting grass and stuff, so I apologize, but that's how it is. I'm in a little neighborhood. I'm surrounded by lots of houses. But anyways, let me get the camera set up here. Oh, all of this is my lovely China Jade cucumbers growing on these vines here. But let me drop this camera. By the way, if you guys can't hear me well or, you know, the video quality is being weird, um, just let me know, please. Sometimes that happens. All right. So this is my uh, China Jade. I direct sow seeds for this not even two months ago and I just harvested my first one today. This is one of my favorites. At, as of today, I'm out of stock of seeds, but I will be having tons of seed in a few weeks. But this is definitely a really great variety um, to grow, especially if you're in the South. So um, this year, I've decided to plant my potatoes here in grow bags. But if you're growing in ground or in raised garden beds, containers, you know, whatever, the planting, the technique, everything is the same. All right, I'm just growing mine in grow bags because quite honestly, I hate digging up tubers. I hate digging up potatoes and sweet potatoes from the ground. Like that's hard work. And you know, you take your shovel, you dig that stuff out, you bust up a lot of those potatoes trying to get them. And you know, they kind of go to waste. You can't cure them, keep them in storage, that kind of thing. So I really like growing potatoes and sweet potatoes in grow bags because I just knock the whole thing over and I harvest everything out. And that's especially important because if you don't harvest everything out and you miss some of these tubers, they'll start popping up randomly all over your garden. And I have a very small garden here, so that would be a problem for me if I just had random potatoes and especially sweet potatoes just popping up all over the place. So grow bags has really helped me control the situation a lot better and making harvest way easier. So this is my preferred method. Um, there are certain grow bags that I like from Amazon that are like kind of heavy duty. So they last you, you know, a couple of years at least, which is a big deal in Florida because these things will deteriorate pretty quickly. So I will send that in um, the email summary as well if you want to know about those. But let me get my gloves on. There's a couple things you have to know about potatoes so that you can properly grow them. And I, I see your question pop up, but I'm kind of far away from the camera right now. I can't reach it. <laughs> so I will answer your questions as soon as I'm done talking about the potatoes. But um, anyway, so these are my grow bags for potatoes. Um, I recommend maybe a 10 gallon size, nothing smaller than that. And you can't go bigger, but the thing is you want to keep in mind how heavy these things are when they're completely full of soil and, you know, at harvest time when they're, when it's full of potatoes. Um, I find that 10 gallons is pretty good for me. I can easily, you know, lift this up, move it, knock it over, whatever I have to do. Um, so that's why I'm using 10 gallon size potato, uh, grow bags for my potatoes. But a um, couple things about potatoes that you need to know so that you can make sure you're growing the right kind for your garden and your environment. Um, first up, when you're shopping around for seed potato, which I recommend you buy actual seed potato. Don't go to the grocery store and just buy potatoes and sprout them. 
I mean, yes, you can do that. They will grow for you, but you can have some issues because first off, you don't know what variety it is, and that's gonna be important, which I'll get into that and reasons why. Um, specifically, sometimes you might not know what variety it is. And two, they're not certified disease free. A lot of potato tubers can carry tons of different kinds of soil diseases, and you don't know if they're certified disease free plant them in your garden and they can infect your soil with whatever those pathogens are so for that reason i do not buy grocery store potatoes or sweet potatoes because i already have tons of soil diseases here in my florida garden i don't need to make the situation worse obviously there's lots of gardeners that have done it you've been fine you didn't have disease problems it grew great that's awesome that definitely can happen but I like to err on caution <laughs> and I don't want to introduce more pathogens and stuff in my garden. So I highly recommend you buy seed potato, actual potatoes grown so that you can replant them in your garden that are certified to be disease free. Very important. Now, there's two things you got to know about potatoes. Um, one, uh, the different cultivars are separated between early, mid and like late season. All right. That just says you know, which ones are gonna start maturing earlier than maybe some of the later ones. Um, so you wanna keep that in mind. <laughs> if you're in a place like here in Florida where there's lots of diseases and pests and stuff, you kinda of wanna plant this thing quickly and then harvest them out quickly. The sooner, the better. So I prefer the early maturing varieties. Um, the, the long season kind, the late season, whatever, grow better, you know, up north in my opinion because you have less of a disease pressure and so you can do that you can have them longer time in your you know your soil and not risk so much <laughs> the, the chances of disease if that makes any sense so i prefer early maturing you know but do whatever you want um it's also going to come down to how are you using these potatoes are you going to roast them are you going to fry them are you going to make mashed potatoes like different types of potatoes are better for different applications uh, most of the early maturing ones aren't going to be like your russets that would be really good for you know frying or mashed potatoes um, They tend to be things like new potatoes red potatoes stuff like that, but I I like those potatoes I like roasting them a lot. So that's totally fine with me um, But yeah, so you got to think about that early mid or late season and your application What are you going to be using these potatoes for which cultivars are better for those uses and then the last thing you got to keep in mind is are, is the potato cultivar that you selected determinate or indeterminate? Just like with tomatoes. They are all part of the same nightshade family, actually. So that matters for, for one simple thing, all right? If you have a determinate um, potato uh, variety, that means it's going to, you're gonna plant these potatoes and it's gonna form tubers horizontally in one layer. It doesn't just form tubers all up and down the stem wherever it comes in contact with soil. Very similar to tomatoes, right? Like wherever indeterminate tomato vines and stems come in contact with soil, they start sprouting roots and all of that kind of thing. Um, so the determinates don't really do that. They just form one kind of even layer of potatoes and that's it. So you wanna plant them at one level and you don't have to be hilling them with dirt. Um, you want to hill them with dirt or whatever you're growing them in if it's indeterminates. Okay, so indeterminates, you're going to plant them, cover it with some soil. They grow a stem a little bit. When that stem's about six to eight inches, you're going to throw more soil on there. Cover that whole stem and keep going, keep going until you reach the top of your container or whatever. Um, and they're going to start sprouting uh, tubers all along the stem. And that's kind of how you increase your production with um, potatoes, with the indeterminates anyways. This doesn't really happen with the determinates, so just plant them as normal, and you don't have to worry about hilling up soil and all of that thing when it comes down to the determinates. So um, I'm growing early maturing cultivars and determinates. In my opinion, the determinates are gonna be a little easier. I don't have to worry about the whole hilling thing or whatever. Um, you just plant them, you're done, okay? And then the determinants also stay smaller in size too. So for smaller gardens and things like that, or growing in grow bags like this, determinants are, are the way to go. And um, I have my own seed potato from my last um, harvest here. Um, actually, I have a YouTube video about this when I harvested, harvested them and everything. I think I harvested them like in May or something like that. That's when all my plants died back. 
But I also planted these um, potatoes like in February, which is kind of too late if you're in the south. Um, you want to get them in like November, maybe December being the latest, and so they grow during the coolest times of the year, okay? Um, and that way you get a nicer, bigger, more productive crop, and you're growing them during the time of year when the disease and pest pressure is lowest, or at its lowest. It's still present, but it's at its lowest. Um, so yeah, so I, this year I was like, I definitely want to get them in on time. I'm going to pop them in the ground right now in November. So um, <clears throat> these are early maturing varieties, and they are determinate. I'm growing Red Norland, which is highly recommended, especially if you're in the state of Florida. And this, I'm not going to say this word right, I'm going to tell you right now, Arondiac, Arondiac blue or blue Arondiac, um, it's a blue colored um, skin and flesh um, potato that holds its blue color um, even when you cook it. So it's very beautiful. Like I said, both of these are determinants and they're early maturing. Um, I see messages, but I can't get to it right now guys, I'm too far from my, um, my phone to like read it, so I'm sorry, but I'll get to you guys as soon as I'm done talking about these um, potatoes. Um, so yeah, so um, let's see, what else? Um, the life cycle of these potatoes and kind of like what to expect. Um, Northern gardeners, you're gonna plant these, you're, you plant your potatoes two to three weeks before your last average spring frost date. You grow them for three to four months, depending on the cultivar, um, you harvest them out. So you're gonna be harvesting maybe early summer, something like that, or middle of summer depending on the cultivar you're growing um, for us southerners um, south usa zones eight and up we plant in november and december you're, you're going to start harvesting three to four months from there so march something like that uh, you know your potatoes are ready for harvest when they start dying back like even in the south even in the warmth they're going to die back the leaves start getting all funky looking and yellowing and they just start dying back and you know okay it's time to harvest these things out so just to kind of give you um, a timeline a little bit of how, you know, this works. Always um, save your own seed. Like if you, you know, if you grew a, a good crop, there weren't, they weren't diseased and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Save your own um, seed potato, which is what I did for my last um, harvest. So I don't have to buy more again this year. So always save a couple, you know, for, for your planting next time. All right, so ideal growing conditions for potatoes. Um, they need full sun. <laughs> they need to gather that energy from the sun so that they can grow nice big tubers for you, right? So full sun, at least eight hours or more. Um, mulching helps, you know, if, especially in the hot climates. Um, you don't want your tubers to get too hot. They're not like a hot weather type of crop or warm weather crop at all. So, you know, if you're planting them in the ground or in containers like this, Mulching the top with mulch or straw or something will help regulate the temperature a little bit and keep it a little bit cooler. Um, as far as spacing, uh, potatoes, they get pretty big. They kind of sprawl out, you know. It's kind of like a vining tomato or more like a tomatillo kind of is what it reminds me of. And it just kind of gets bushy and, and you know, vines out. So you want to give them space, plant them. I, I recommend like 15 inches apart, a minimum 12 inches apart if you can. Um, so that's planting in, in soil, right? But if you're planting in grow bags, kind of like my rule of thumb is about three max um, seed potatoes per five gallons, all right? Like two to three seed potatoes for every five gallons worth of, you know, grow bag or container or whatever you're using. Again, this is a 10 gallon um, grow bag. So I think I'm going to put just five in here max um, and space them out. And that's totally fine. As far as um, fertilizer, initially, um, dang, I didn't bring my fertilizer over here. <laughs> initially, uh, you want to give them some kind of a balanced fertilizer. I'm going to use uh, Espoma brand Garden Tone or Tomato Tone because that's just what I have all the time. And put a nice handful of that into your planting hole or your grow bags um, because you want these to get to a get on to like a good start, right? Just start growing, putting on leaf um, growth and all of that immediately that's usually what's just more important something um, that's balanced so that these plants can get off to a good start about one and a half months or like six weeks after you planted them you're going to switch your focus to fertilizers that are heavier in potassium and phosphorus because those help uh, the plants focus more on bigger you know tuber and root development 
Um, so at the planting time, I didn't bring my fertilizer out here, but I would be sprinkling in a whole bunch of um, that garden tone. You could use 10, 10, 10, you know, whatever general balanced fertilizer you can find. Sprinkle it in there, and then I'm gonna, I always like to put um, super uh, phosphate um, in there too at planting time, because this is probably the most important um, this is the phosphorus portion of you know fertilizers uh, to get that big tuber growth right so put in some you know balanced fertilizer and then sprinkle in some kind of a extra phosphate whatever you can find this is high yield, high yield super phosphate this is just what I've been able to find locally but there's lots of other sources of phosphate that you can potentially find it doesn't matter you know what what it is just as long as you up the number of phosphate in terms of you know the fertilizers you're mixing in there anyway so um, that's what I would do right now at planting time, kind of work that into the soil. Then you're going to take your potatoes. Um, mine already started sprouting on their own. I had them in the same basket since I harvested them with some layers of paper towels just to kind of keep it um, more dry. Um, and they, they look great. None of them rotted out or anything like that. You want to check your potato, your seed potatoes, um, make sure that they haven't, you know, got soft or squishy or have mold or things like that growing on it and then like I said just select um, five of them here if you have let's say um, you bought some seed potato but it's not a lot and you want more plants you can cut these and divide them you know like well, let me see if I find one here that has multiple eyes mine are kind of on the small side to be honest but let's pretend <laughs> that this potato had a sprout here and a sprout on this other side, you could just cut it right in half and now you have two seed potatoes. And uh, the only thing is you gotta do that maybe like three to five days before you plan on planting them, just so that cut can kind of heal over, scab over. Um, that way when you plant it, bacterias and stuff like that can't get into the potatoes and rot it out and you know kill it. Basically kill the spud, kill the plant. So mine are pretty small, they have pretty much one sprout and I have a lot of them and I have a whole row here of grow bags so I have plenty I'm not going to be cutting mine in half or anything like that so like I said I'm going to put about five here just eyeball it space them out I have them on the edges here actually you know what I think I'm going to do six because I'm going to put one in the middle here okay so you put your potatoes in there now you're going to cover it with dirt um, Actually, you know what? This is pretty deep here. Um, I have this filled with soil, probably, I don't know if you guys can see that, actually. Like I said, determinants, um, you're not going to be hilling soil on them. So you want to fill your grow bag up to about four or five inches from the top, set your potatoes there, and then fill it, you know, with soil, like to the top, with the determinants. If it's indeterminate, you're going to fill your grow bag maybe the first four inches from the bottom put your indeterminates uh sea potatoes put about four or five inches of more soil on top of that and it should be like still at the bottom of your grow bag then you know leave it alone you're not going to put more soil on it as the season progresses you're going to see sprouts and stems when those stems get to be six to eight inches long you're going to throw more soil on it until you reach the very top of your container or grow bag if you are planting in ground, what I used to do is dig a trench and I would plant my potatoes there and then kind of hill using that trench and then hill it up and it kind of makes like a mound. That's just how I would do it um, underground. As far as watering, um, you know, they're not like tomatoes where they like a lot, a lot of water, but you don't want them to dry out either. Uh, I would do the finger test. If you stick your finger in here and it's dry to your second knuckle, then they need water. If it's still moist, don't water them. You don't want to overwater. That's going to encourage like root rot or the potatoes to rot out and introduce diseases, bacteria, pathogens, all kinds of things like that. Um, which is another reason too why I really like using grow bags. I'm in Florida. It rains here like crazy sometimes. Um, our winter time in early spring is dry season actually, so it's not that much of an issue, but when it rains, it really pours. So growing in grow bags really, really helps. Um, you know, a con of grow bags is that they drain and dry out um, much quicker, you know, than other containers and stuff like that. But I kind of use that to my advantage here in Florida. 
and these potatoes grew very well. I didn't have any, you know, rot out or stuff like that. Um, and that's uh, pretty much it when it comes to planting your potatoes. Um, just really quick, kind of like common diseases and pests that you might experience when you're growing potatoes so you're prepared um, and you know exactly what to do when you see these things. Uh, first off, potatoes get everything. There are so many diseases and pests that potatoes get. Um, you know, if you thought tomatoes were hard to grow, potatoes, in my opinion, are even harder. They get everything that occurs above ground and below ground. <laughs> So you just you're just gonna get it all. Just be prepared. Keep your soil clean. You know, if it, it's there's a lot. If you can solarize the area before planting, even better. Um, so again, you know, get your timing right so you're just planting them during the times of year where the pests and disease pressure is just low, anyways. Um, you know, and, and see how it goes. <laughs> Hopefully, you have good seed potato as well. But anyways, diseases you can get bacterial back there's bacteria, viruses, funguses, like everything that can infect these things. Um, if you get leaf diseases like powdery mildew, blight, that kind of thing, those are pretty easy to manage. You, I just spray with one cup of hydrogen peroxide per gallon of water and that pretty much cleans and disinfects everything, which is what I've been doing with these cucumbers and they look perfect. I don't see any disease, they're green, they just, they look amazing, perfect. So. Um, that hydrogen peroxide really does work. Um, now, if they get some kind of bacteria, virus, fungus underground, that tends to now become a systemic problem. It infects the insides of your plants, um, like tomato wilt virus. If, if they get that, that's it. There's like no cure for that. It's a systemic, it's inside of that plant, um, it's done. Like you just, the best thing is to get rid of it. So if you get that on your potatoes or something like that, it's best to just get rid of it. Don't compost with it, nothing. Just get rid of it. It's just uh, now a host for whatever that pathogen is. Um, so hopefully you just have issues with leaf type of diseases because that's just way easier to take care of. As far as pests, you'll get all the kind of pests that bother tomatoes. Um, you've got aphids, spider mites, thrips, and um, worms. Um, the aphids, spider mites, and thrips can be controlled Generally, the first thing I'm going to do is use um, a, an organic insecticidal soap, all right? If the situation continues to worsen, then I'll switch to spinosad, which is still an organic spray. It's just a little bit more like heavy duty and it lasts um, in the environment. Like it'll stay on the surface of the leaves and stuff for a good maybe seven days. It doesn't wash off as easy as some of the other things. So. Um, I like spinosad, don't get me wrong, but I always try to go with the um, the lesser uh, treatment first before I switch to something a little bit more um, substantial. But spider mites, um, they're, they suck. <laughs> I hate spider mites. I think those are pretty tough because they, they very quickly populate and then they spread. So, you know, and they're on the under, undersides of the leaves. That's hard to spray, you know, and get to them. Um, I had a really bad spider mite problem um, in springtime this year, so it really took out a lot of my uh, tomatoes, and I hope I don't have the same problem uh, with the potatoes. But um, the other um, issue, you might get worms. You know, worms like to chew up leaves for tomatoes. They, they like to chew up leaves for potatoes, too. For worms, I use BT, um, which stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacterial, organic bacterial spray. When the worms chew the leaves that have been sprayed with this product, um, they ingest it and, it and it kills them. It's very effective. But there are some cases where maybe your worm infestation is just real extra, extra bad. Or they're really tough kind of worms like um, the tomato horn worm, which I, I don't think you get tomato horn worms on your potatoes. But just to give you an idea, if, if you use BT and it just doesn't seem like it's working, then switch to spinosad. <laughs> All right. And um, that's pretty much it. Oh, oh yeah, the Colorado potato beetle. That is a very common pest when you're growing potatoes. Um, for that, you're gonna wanna use spinosad or hand pick them off. If you're using spinosad, it pretty much kills their larva. So that's kind of how you control the situation. You just stop their, you know, their attempts to populate your garden by killing the larva with the spinosad. Um, or you can hand pick them. But usually my experience with pests that uh, people say you handpick, 
here in Florida is that I have them in such high numbers that no amount of hand picking is going to keep up with it. So, and they're gross. I don't want to be touching them. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't want to touch a lot of these um, pests, you know. So, so yeah, spinosad is great for that. Um, if you get pests that eat the tubers, like little worms that um, bore little holes into your potatoes. So if you like harvest your potatoes out of the season and you're like, what is this? They've got little holes all over the place. Um, those are various different worms and things. There's really nothing you can do about that because you don't know. You don't know that that's happening underneath um, in your soil. You can see what's happening above on the leaves and the stems. But, you know, if it's happening underground, you just honestly, you're just not going to know until you harvest. Um, but if that's the case, you know, crop rotation is really important. Don't plant your next um, season of potatoes in the same spot. Um, just, you know, try to use new soil if you can, that kind of thing. Um, so that, the same goes with nematodes as well, because that, that can also affect um, your tubers. Nematodes is a real tough pest, especially for us southerners here. But same thing, crop rotation is very important. This is part of the nightshade family, so that includes tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes. You don't want to plant any of those things in the same area, I believe they say for at least three years. So crop rotation is really, really important. Um, okay, so I think that's everything about potatoes. Just a real qu quick rundown about potatoes. Let me get my uh, phone back so I can answer your questions, all right? One second. just let me know if you guys can hear me okay usually I ask that at the beginning um, let's see let's stop for a question break here oh man there's a lot of questions you know what for some reason I can't see them very well dang um <laughs> maybe it's because of the sun glare on my phone All right, um, you've been listening to me for a couple months now. First time, I'm so happy. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's exactly why I do what I do. I try to think about when I started gardening, um, what was the most helpful type of information out there. And I really think about how to present that stuff to break it down and just make it real easy, especially for people that are new. Um, and I just put content out there, the stuff that I like, the same stuff that I like to watch, um, that I find most helpful. So I do this for you guys. All right. Um, Red New Orleans, wait, uh, where do I find seed potatoes this time of year? Um, check out your local nurseries, connect on your Facebook groups, um, garden groups. That's the most helpful. Honestly, no matter where you're located, what state, I guarantee you there's a garden, a Facebook garden group for your state and your zone. Ask around there because that's how you can find like local places that will carry seed potato at the correct time of year planting because yeah, it can be a little hard finding some. Um, a lot of the bigger like websites and stuff like that, they, they're up north most of the time and they plant their potatoes at a whole different time than us. So they don't have like seed potato available right now, you know? So, um, but definitely you can try lots of different websites. Um, try Haas tools. Um, Fedco Seeds, Etsy even sometimes has some, uh, but my first thing would be ask around the Facebook garden groups because m someone would has to know where you can find it locally that would carry the cultivars that do well in your area. Um, Red Norlands grow well here for me, but that bluish, I think, Pontiac, oh, the blue one is called Arondiac Blue. Arondi I don't know how you say that word. I know I'm saying it wrong, but it's called Arondiac um, Blue. What shouldn't we plant next to potatoes? I only grow in grow bags. Do I need to keep them separate from other vegetables? Um, uh, you don't really necessarily have to keep them separate from other vegetables, but they grow pretty big, so it's hard to companion plant or find things that will fit in there and be okay. Um, you might get away with planting a crop that grows upward vertically, right? It's because when potatoes grow, they sprawl out horizontally kind of low to the ground. I would say at least like 12 inches or so up. 
Um, so if you can plant something that will grow up vertically or a really tall plant in the middle or something like that so that the potatoes can still get sun horizontally, the space around them, and the, the, your, you know, your tall plant, um, maybe, maybe something like a pepper or um, Swiss chard, uh, flowers, herbs, that kind of thing would be okay maybe in the middle and then have your potatoes, you know, sprawl out and come out of the container or, the, uh, or your grow bags around it. Or you can build a trellis and plant things like cucumbers, peas, that kind of thing. I'm not sure where you're located, um, but right now it's not the time to be planting cucumbers. You can plant, uh, if you're in the south, like I'm in Florida, you can plant herbs um, and peas. November is the time to start planting all sorts of peas for us um, hot climate gardeners. Did you mention soil? Oh. I, I didn't. That's I'm glad you caught that. Um, for growing potatoes, they kind of like soil on the acidic side. Um, so see what you can find. It's hard. Like I just went into my um, local Home Depot and Lowe's trying to find soil that was, uh, you know, a blend for acidic things like a rhododendron or camellia kind of blend. They were all out. So my next thing was making my own by, you know, getting potty mix or compost and mixing in a bunch of peat moss and like sulfur. They sell sulfur to acidify your soil. I couldn't find none of that. None of it. None of it. And I have to plant now. So I don't have time to keep going around town trying to find this stuff. But if you can find, um, you know, a, a blend of soil that is made for acid loving plants or berries or rhododendron, something like that, go with that or mix your own. Peat moss is supposed to acidify things, add sulfur um, with whatever you can find, which is what I'm doing. I, quite honestly, I just go and buy the cheapest bags of compost I can find at Home Depot. It's a bag, I don't know what brand it is, but it's white and yellow. And I know not, that not all Home Depots carry it, okay? A lot of people have told me that because I'm, I talk about it all the time. I, I buy the cheapest compost. I don't mix anything else into it. I just pure put compost into my grow bags. But it's a good quality compost and it hasn't um, burned any of my plants. Usually when um, gardeners report that, yeah, I use this compost and it burned my plants, it meant that that compost did not sit long enough. It didn't break down long enough to be gentle and not burn your plants. So that's not a good brand of compost to go with. But in all my years gardening, I've been using the same cheap compost. I've never had any of my plants burn. So all in all, use what you can find. <laughs> Potatoes aren't that picky. If you can't find like something um, that will acidify the soil, it's not it's not a deal breaker. Um, just you know, use whatever you can find. Um, how do you save onion seeds? You gotta wait. You gotta wait. Onions at the end of the season, they they will shoot up a flower bulb, and you gotta wait for that flower, not a flower bulb, it's a flower bud. It's really pretty. And you gotta wait for that to dry out, and then you can harvest your seeds from that. But that from planting onions to getting to that point, it's it's a long time. But that's how you harvest onion um, seeds. Um You've been soaking half your potatoes for almost two weeks now. It's beginning to smell. What do you do? Um, I've never soaked my potatoes. Um, I don't know uh, who said to do that or whatever. I mean, maybe there's a reason for it. I don't know. I personally have never soaked my potatoes, though. I soak my strawberry bare roots, which we're about to get into in a little bit here, but not potatoes because, yeah, they're just going to rot. Um, to get potatoes to sprout, I mean, normally they will start sprouting on their own. But again, I'm, I'm not sure where you got your seed potato from. If you get it from the grocery store, a lot of them have been sprayed with growth inhibitors and they're not going to sprout for you. So that's again why I recommend, you know, don't, don't get grocery store stuff. You have espoma berry tone to acidified certain plants. That is a great idea, actually. Um, I use um, Miracle Grow has an acid lovers fertilizer mix blend. Um, it's usually used for like uh, berries, strawberries, blueberries. Um, so that way, when as you're fertilizing, it also lowers the pH at the same time. And that's what I'm going to use um, for my strawberries. And I forgot about that for um, the uh, the potatoes, but same thing. 
Oh, you got it from the grocery store. Okay, I, I'm i gonna probably, it's safe to assume that the potatoes you got from the grocery store have been sprayed with growth inhibitors and they're not gonna sprout for you. So just throw that out. <laughs> Go find um, a new you know set of actual seed potatoes if you can. Okay, I think I've caught up in all the questions. Let's move on to our next crop and that's strawberries. So let me get my notes here. Let me move um, to an area where I can show you how to plant this stuff because I have some strawberry crowns that I've been soaking for about an hour here. Just a second, guys. I'm trying to find a bare spot in my garden. My garden is so lush right now. I, I have started harvesting so much. Okra, squash, um, eggplants. I mean, this morning I was harvesting so much. Roselle, it's Roselle season. If you're in the South, you know what I mean. <laughs> all the Facebook groups, all the social media, everyone in the South is harvesting Roselle right now. So um, in the South, it's not cold enough to uh, grow cranberries. So we grow Roselle, which you can use exactly like you would um, strawberry, uh, uh, cranberries. I'm trying to find how to show you guys i wish i had a cameraman i really do <laughs> um i don't know if you guys can see the soil level so you can see how i plant these strawberries all right first up let's talk about strawberries so you pick the right ones then i'll drop down to the soil level um there's some very important things that you need to know about strawberries and the differences between the cultivars okay so um first up there's about four main categories of strawberries. The first one you have is June bearing. They're called June bearing strawberries. This is the biggest um, of the four um, different categories. They, they produce the biggest in size um, strawberries. Um, but these only produce one large crop, usually in early summer. So this is great for Northern gardeners, people who are gardening in cold climates or have very short um, growing seasons when you would be growing strawberries during the summer anyways. So I don't recommend June bearing strawberries for Southern gardeners because we grow our strawberries during the fall, winter and very early spring. So that's not ideal for you. Um, the next category is ever bearing strawberries. These fruit continuously throughout the summer. Um, they are daylight sensitive, which means they're triggered to flower and produce fruit when the days are very long, like in the summertime. Um, so um that also is really great if you're up north not so great if you're a southern gardener then we have day neutral strawberries these produce fruit consistently from spring to fall and they are not sensitive to daylight hours or any of that stuff and they're pretty easy to grow in most all regions no matter where you're located um, some popular cultivars uh, that are day neutral include tristar and tribute so that might be an option for you then the last category and the fourth category are um, short day strawberry cultivars. This is a more newer category actually. Um, there has been a lot of breeding efforts, especially by a lot of the Florida State Universities to breed strawberries that are more adaptable to our climate and don't require lots of daylight hours to produce because we grow our strawberries fall, winter, and spring. And that's when the daylight hours are at its lowest, right? The lowest time of the year for daylight hours is winter time, really. So, um, they have developed a lot of different cultivars of strawberries that will produce with less daylight um, so that we can properly grow them during, you know, the winter time. So um, a lot of these uh, cultivars, maybe you've heard of them before, um, Florida Brilliance, Sweet Sensation, Florida Radiance, Strawberry Festival, which is the one I'm growing um, this season. It's named after the Strawberry Festival in Plant City that happens every year. Um, here in Florida and so that is a very very famous and popular um, strawberry cultivar for um, southern gardeners so in general all these strawberry farmers and all that here in Florida will start planting their um, strawberries during the fall and typically um, you can start harvesting like in December depending on how early you planted them all the way up through March maybe April depending on how hot it gets because for us southern gardeners it's the heat that kills our strawberry plants. 
um, and they're not perennial here in the south um, like they are for gardeners up north because strawberries like it cold. So up north, they're perennial because, well, the heat you don't have the heat to kill them and it gets cold, but they're okay. So that's the difference there. And northern gardeners can cut off runners and propagate more strawberry plants. For us southern gardeners, that's very, I'm not gonna say impossible, but it's very difficult because as soon as that heat comes, it, it just kills the strawberry plants. So we treat them more kind of like a, a long-lived annual, so to speak, because they do produce for many, many months from there, as long as the plants are alive, okay? They're not getting killed by heat or some kind of pest or something like that. So just to give you an idea of, you know, the growth cycle and what to expect uh, when you're growing um, strawberries. Sorry, my screen here is doing whatever it wants to do. <laughs> okay, so um, I like to plant my strawberries from bare roots. So I have here some strawberry bare roots that I've been soaking for about an hour because they are very dry when you get them, you know, mailed to you or whatever. And you just want to kind of rehydrate them before you plant them. So they've been soaking in here, just plain old water for an hour. Um, again, where do you buy these bare roots? Um, ask your Facebook groups, try to find a local seller. But quite honestly, what happens is um, all the local sellers, backyard nurseries, stuff like that, will start taking pre-orders in about August, September, something like that. And they always sell out, they're gone. So if you wait until the time to actually plant strawberries, it can get really hard to find some that are left. Like who has some more strawberry bare roots at this point. So try and ask around your Facebook groups. That's what I'm gonna recommend. Excuse me. I've had a lot of people tell me that they've bought strawberry bare roots from Amazon, from Etsy, you know, that's fine and that they grew fine for them so that is totally fine but i always recommend support local and that also increases your chances of finding the cultivars that will actually grow best in your area anyways all right so um and i got mine from practical plants just if you want to know um they are florida-based backyard nursery kind of like me um and he shipped them to me but he doesn't ship out of state and i do believe at this point he is sold out but just so you remember practical plants for next year Oh, Parkdale Farms. You know, I, I've i tried calling Parkdale Farms or their farmer. Do you mean their farmer market? The famous one that has the strawberry ice cream sundaes or like a different company because, um, yeah, that is like the center of strawberry growing in Florida, Plant City. So I was like, I'm sure there's lots of places around there that have strawberry bare roots. They're probably planting all of their fields right now. Uh, and maybe have extras. I don't know, but I just don't know who to contact over there. Okay, so um, let me move on here. I look at my notes because there's a lot of information. I want to make sure I pass that along to you guys. Um, when to plant your bare root strawberries. If you are zones four to seven, you're going to plant your strawberries in the spring as soon as your last average spring frost date has passed. Um, and the ground is workable. In zones 8 to 11 in the south, not Pacific Northwest people zone 8 or 9, because that's just an odd scenario, um, but southern United States zones 8 to 11, you're going to plant them in the fall, October and November. Um, that's the best time to grow them and to ensure that you have tons of opportunity to harvest a lot of them before, you know, the summer heat arrives and kills the plants off. Ideal growing conditions for strawberries, they need full sun. If you want to get a lot of berry production, you've got to plant them in full sun. So we're talking eight hours or more. Um, the soil, they need rich soil. Soil that is rich in organic matter um, and that drains really well because if their roots sit in water for a long period of time, it will easily cause root rot. Okay, so um, rich soil, again, bringing up the topic of soils, I try really hard to find like a berry blend. I know Fox Farms has a strawberry fields um, bag of soil, but I can't find any where I'm at right now. Um, or the rhododendron, camellia, you know, acid loving plant mix type things, couldn't find any of that. Mix your own <laughs> with compost and a lot of peat moss because peat moss um, will lower the acidity or pH of soil. So that helps and add sulfur in there. And then fertilize with an acid loving blend like the miracle grow they used to call it mirror acid but they changed it now i think to acid lovers mix or something like that 
Um, just to give you ideas, again, lowering that pH for these berries, this that's more important for strawberries than it is for the potatoes that I, I mentioned. Um, all berries, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, they all, blackberries, they all really like um, soil on the acidic side. Um, all right, so spacing for strawberries. You want to plant them like 10 to 12 inches apart. I don't know if you've ever been to a strawberry farm before and gone strawberry picking. I go multiple times a year when it's strawberry season, but you'll see like they're pretty compact plants. They kind of stay nice and round. Um, they'll send out runners here and there, um, which you can propagate, um, especially if you're up north, propagating them is a great idea. Um, so, but, but in general, they're pretty small little plants and a great option for, you know, small space type of gardens. Um, all right, so let's get on to how to plant these bare root strawberries. Um, like I said, start off soaking them for like an hour to rehydrate them. Um, I'm going to show you how to plant them in the ground, but there's also, I mean, you can plant them in grow, grow towers, um, grow bags, the hanging kind, there's all kinds of stuff. I am kind of experimenting this season with both ways in grow bags and in a hanging grow bag actually that I found as well. My concern with the hanging grow bag is that it will dry out very fast or that when I water it, the water won't go through all the way and dry out evenly and that kind of thing because that can kind of happen with the hanging stuff. Um, but I want to test it out because if it works, I can cram like 12 strawberry plants on one little hanging um, bag and that will save me a lot of space in my garden because then I can use the ground space beneath it to grow something else. So that's kind of what I'm just experimenting with to see if that works this year. Um, okay, so let me drop the camera down. Um, as always, very important that you add some kind of fertilizer into the planting hole for anything that you are planting. Don't, it doesn't matter. Tomatoes, potatoes, strawberries, squash. If you're planting a transplant, add some fertilizer in the soil to help your transplant get well adjusted and put on as much growth as possible. All right, so there's my soil. Dang, that's hard. That's hard for you guys to see, I know. I'm sorry. That little meter thing there is a soil moisture meter um, that is connected to my automatic watering system that I can activate from my phone. It's the Rainpoint um, brand. So this meter is really cool because, you know, if the weather says 80% chance of rain, but many times it might not actually rain on my little garden, right? It might rain a couple streets down or something like that. But this moisture meter will tell you if it actually rained in your garden. So that's why I have it. And then it goes to a Wi-Fi setup, um, rain point watering system with an app. I can look at it from anywhere in the world. I love this thing. This has been a game changing um, thing for me and this drip irrigation system too. I have a YouTube video tutorial showing you all about this stuff, but I have to say, I cannot believe I waited <laughs> all my life to finally do this. It has been a huge, huge time saver for me. But anyways, um, you see the soil here. This is heavily, heavily composted down soil. I've been living here for seven years and the very first thing I did was get a free delivery of mulch. You can use chip drop and I mulched everything. So, and I pretty much do that continuously every year. I'm getting another load and mulching the heck out of everything. And I have a good solid, I don't know, 12 to 15 inches of dark, rich, composted down soil. So this is going to be great for my strawberries. Um, okay. So the strawberry let's talk about the parts of this strawberry bare roots because you have a crown and then you have the roots and it's important to realize what they are let me see if I find one here that's a good example All right. they look they look like little little aliens okay <laughs> they look kind of gross but anyways these are just dead little leaves here um, this is the root system right here you can see these roots this is the strawberry crown, this little portion right here. All right, so you got roots down here, you got a crown right here. The crown is where all the growth is gonna come out of, the stems, leaves, all of that kind of stuff. You have to make sure this crown doesn't get buried. Don't bury this in the soil, you're gonna bury it just 
till you get to that level of where you're covering all of the roots, but not the crown. Don't ever bury the crown because it will rot out and then your whole plant dies. There's nothing you can do. So make sure you take a good look at your strawberry um, bare roots, identify the crown, the roots, and then plant it, you know, accordingly. I'm just taking off these extra dead uh, stems here. All right. So that's what they look like. I know it doesn't look like much, but literally these things grow so fast. Okay, so, um, you know, just dig a hole. Like I said, if you're planting in ground, you wanna conserve a spacing like 10 to 12 inches apart. If you're planting in grow bags or hanging thing, then well, you gotta just do your best, right? <laughs> you gotta follow uh, the grow bag size or the hanging um, basket container or whatever. So, um, but either way, it's the same way to plant this stuff. You're gonna dig a hole. It doesn't have to be that shallow because again, you're not gonna bury the crown portion. Um, mix into this hole a balanced fertilizer, um, granules, whatever in here. Um, I also like to put in a good amount of blood meal because blood meal is high in nitrogen um, and that's gonna promote lots of lush, leafy green growth. The bigger these plants are, the more leaves, the more it's gonna output flowers and berries, okay? So initially, fertilizing with something higher on the nitrogen side is ideal, okay? So whatever fertilizer you find, just, you know, make sure that nitrogen number is higher than the rest. Sprinkle some of that in here and, you know, put this little, can you guys see that? <laughs> put the root in there and just bury it, keeping that crown above the soil level. Don't ever bury the crown, okay? All right, so there you go. And that's it. They're very, very easy to plant. Oof. I'm gonna wait for that car to pass. So <laughs> Typical Florida neighborhood for you, okay? <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, so plant your rows or plant them in grow bags. If you're doing the hanging um, type of grow bags or towers, you know, Put a little fertilizer in that spot. It's totally fine. Um, okay. Uh, it is very important that you mulch with strawberries, especially if you're growing in ground, because these plants aren't that big, okay? They get maybe at the most 12 inches tall. They're kind of mounding type of plants. And if there's a lot of weeds or other plants around it, it's going to block out sunlight, and it's definitely going to affect your strawberry production. They do not like, you know, weeds or whatever. Uh, messing around with their growth and their space. So mulching will help with that and mulching will help conserve moisture. Um, and just, you know, mulching is always great for lots of different reasons. So if you can, you know, mulch the area, keep it weed free, and that will definitely help a lot with your strawberries. Um, as far as water, they do like consistent amounts of water. If they don't get enough water, the berries won't form properly. They'll be weird shapes and stuff like that. Um, just give them consistent watering. If you see that they're wilting and they don't recover by the end, you know, by evening time, then that means they really do need some water. Or just do the finger test. Like I always say, stick your finger in there. If it's dry to your second knuckle, it needs some water. Um, but again, you don't want to overwater. Don't plant them in an area where that is prone to flooding and stuff like that because if that water sits around here and rots out either the roots or the crown, your whole plant is dead. Um... One second, guys. The wind blew everything apart here. Um, I was on page four. I had four pages of notes. <laughs> I hate forgetting things, so that's why I decided to do notes this time. Um, okay, so let's talk about common pests and diseases that you might encounter when you're growing strawberries. Let me, let me change this up now. Now we can just talk like normal. <laughs> I think it's getting kind of dark pretty soon. How off, How do I keep critters away? You know, I'm very blessed I don't have a critter problem, okay? I don't know if you can see all the white. That's my privacy fencing. I'm in a neighborhood. We don't have a lot. We don't have like deer running through and stuff like that. I've never seen a raccoon since I've been living here. Um, or, you know, rabbits in my yard. Well, they can't get in because I have the high fencing around the entire backyard. So I don't have a critter problem, but I know a lot of you do because yeah, it's very common. You got rabbits, you got mice, you have rats, whatever. I don't have mice or rats because I have a, I have a garden snake. I don't like him, 
but he lives here and i actually have just i saw him yesterday um but ever since he's been here like i don't have any kind of rodent problem so he can stay he can stay for now um but that's it <laughs> the only issue i have are some squirrels that like to eat the food out of my um bird feeders but i honestly i haven't had an issue with critters i'm blessed for that because if i did you better believe i would build like wooden <laughs> Uh, barrier fencing with uh, chicken um, wire and all of that all over the place to block um, to kind of enclose the whole area um, so yeah that's that's how I deal with the critters um, I just I'm I'm lucky I just don't have any and, and if you have a critter problem you got to identify what kind of critter it is so that you know how to take care of it or whatever you got to do to deter it or remove it or whatever um, so, you know, a lot of times people don't, you don't see what's eating up your plants. They come at night or whatever. So that's, that's tough. It's tough. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not the best person to advise on, you know, critter problems. You know, I do get birds that like to peck at my tomatoes and they will come for the strawberries too. So for that, um, I actually buy these organza like treat baggies from Amazon. They're really cheap. Like you get a bag of like a hundred of them for like five, $7, something like that. And I cover, you know, tie them around my potato, uh, my tomatoes as they're ripening up on the vine. Um, and, the, you know, the little strawberries and clusters and stuff like that. And that, that really helps. I make sure to buy like a weird color, like a, a purple or something like that. So it kind of masks, or a blue. So it kind of masks like the red ripening color that alerts all the birds that there's something there to eat. Um, but that's, that's pretty much it. I've been very fortunate, very lucky. I know some of you Floridians get iguanas and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know how you do it. I really don't without having to lock down your whole like backyard somehow. All right, let's talk about common strawberry diseases and pests so that you're prepared when you see them. Um, the most common thing is fungal type diseases when it comes to strawberries. You got powdery mildew, lots of different funguses. I'm not gonna list them all out. I just assume in Florida, you get them all. Okay, if you're in the South, um, you're just gonna get them all. Just know, like, if you see yellowing, black spots, powdery mildew, those are all fungus-related type things. Um, again, the one cup hydrogen peroxide per gallon of water is your best friend. I got blight really bad on all of my tomatoes, and I was spraying, like, every other day, and it went away within, like, five days. Gone. They're healed up. All the black lesions and stuff on them, gone. Like, gone. They look like perfect green, uh, healthy tomatoes. Um, so that also will work on um, your strawberries. Um, planting strawberries in an area that gets good airflow is going to be really important because, again, these pathogens, all these funguses and all that kind of thing really spread on the surfaces on the surface of leaves that are wet, right? So if they have nice airflow and everything and you're not growing everything like real close to each other, um, the leaves dry up and you have less of an incidence of not just funguses but a lot of other things as well. Um, so yeah, the fungus thing is, is going to be your best, uh, your probably your number one thing. Uh, some people like to use copper fungicides. I don't use copper or anything in my garden because copper doesn't break down um, and it will just build up in your soil over time. So I personally, that's not what I use, but I'm telling you about it because a lot of other people do and do whatever works in your garden, right? Uh, I'm not going to judge you. <laughs> do whatever works best for you and your unique garden situation. Okay. Um, as far as pests, pretty much the same kind of pests. Um, when I was talking about the, the uh, potatoes, um, aphids love strawberries. They love sucking the tender new green growth. Um, and if the infestation gets bad enough, um, it's a problem. So in my case, I, I, I get aphids, right? I do. I get aphids on everything. Oh my, I thought I, I heard the snake. <laughs> I've seen him down this same row. Okay, so anyways, I guess it's not him, but <laughs> anyways, um, the aphids. Okay, this is what I do when it comes to aphids. They're gross. They don't, they're, they just look gross, right? But I don't treat for them. I leave them alone because wherever I see aphids, if you inspect, most likely you're going to see a ton of ladybugs too. They eat the aphids. And I have so many ladybugs in my garden right now, and I see them eating these aphids. So you can blast the aphids off with like a hard blast of water from your water hose but if you put some kind of a treatment you're going to kill the ladybugs so 
I leave it alone. That's just me though. I leave it alone. The situation tends to clear up on its own because those ladybugs will come in and find them. Now, if it doesn't clear up and your plant is, usually the new growth will kind of look crinkled. Like it's not able to get, you know, nice and long and healthy the way that it should. It kind of looks shrunken up and stuff like that. Um, that, that means, yeah, the aphids are getting pretty bad. They're really sucking a lot of those juices out. Okay, maybe I need to do something about it now. <laughs> I don't know if you guys hear these cars, but anyways. Um, so for aphids, they're a soft bodied insect. Um, you can use spinosad on them because spinosad kills on contact of soft bodied insects. Um, but they're a sucking insect, so something like BT isn't going to work because BT, they need to chew it, ingest it. Um, so piercing and sucking insects, BT is not going to work. But spinosad will work because it has the added benefit of killing on contact. So if you get aphids and it's really bad, go ahead and, and use some spinosad. Um, spider mites, thrips also are, are an issue when it comes to growing strawberries same thing um those spider mites as soon as you see a spider mite infection or infestation start treating it back to back to back to back to back because they very quickly overpopulate and take down your plants and then spread to other plants i, ha I had them real bad this spring so um as soon as you see it don't sit on it start treating it again spinosad will kill them um you just got to make sure you get under those leaves so use one of those like sprayers with the um i don't know the hand attachment that's really long so you can get under those leaves um same thing worms snails like to chew up strawberries um you know a lot of the farmers in florida you know if you go to a strawberry farm you i've i've never seen a strawberry farm that doesn't use black plastic rows where they like puncture little holes and they plant the strawberry plant in there that black pa plastic keeps weeds down it keeps the soil warm so that way if you get a cold front or something like that um your plants are okay and it picks the plants up off from the ground which means a lot of the pathogens and diseases and stuff like that that live in the soil don't have an opportunity to splash back up get on the leaves and start spreading and it also picks them up from the soil to where uh snails and stuff like that have a harder time getting up on onto the plants and the fruit so that's why all of these farms use black plastic like rows if you've noticed that um so if you could do that that's great you know but for us home backyard gardeners it's usually not <laughs> how you're um growing things um but yeah if you get snails stuff like that uh, slugs use uh beer traps and there's other sorts of traps and stuff like that that you can find on amazon um what was I saying? Oh, the worms, uh, BT or spinosad works for all sorts of worms. And that's pretty much it. The birds are going to come after them too. So, you know, put up bird netting if you have to, or, or use those organza treat bags, um, like I've done before. Uh, so you try and harvest things first thing in the morning before all the birds start coming and, and taking everything. People have even put like strings of like party foil decoration i don't know what that's called like the foil because the bright lights and stuff like that are sparkly things um deter birds as well so that's just another idea for you <laughs> okay so let me just check um if there's any last questions here because that's it guys so i've showed you guys how to plant potatoes and strawberries um i don't know when i'm gonna have the next garden class yet it depends again what i have um growing and, and stuff like that but um, let me back up here to my comments and stuff. What variety of strawberries do I, do I grow? This year I'm growing Strawberry Festival, the festival cultivar. It's a very, very popular, well-known one grown here in Florida. Um, I have grown it before. Um, I've tried different cultivars. I think I've tried um, Sweet Charlie once before. Um, and they all do really good, just as long as you're picking the correct one for your area. But this year, it's uh, Strawberry Festival specifically that I'm, I'm growing. Um, do I know of anyone that has potatoes for seed for fall? Most places online don't have any. Yep, because uh, they grow theirs at different times of the year, so they don't really have them ready for us southern gardeners when we're planting them now in fall. Um, ask around Facebook groups. If you're always trying to find something, ask your garden Facebook groups. They will point you in the right direction at all times. Um, you can try Etsy. You can try Amazon. 
Uh, but first thing, I, I would definitely just check the Facebook garden groups. Just ask a question. Somebody will, will you know, recommend something to you. Um, trying to go through the comments. Oh, will it be okay? Okay, you just got your strawberry bare roots, but you're not ready to plant. Will they be okay if I leave them for another week or two? Not two weeks, for sure maybe a week but the thing is that these are these are roots that are drying out <laughs> like with every day that passes by they get more and more dried out um i always plant mine immediately like i got mine three days ago so i guess that's not really immediately but like i wouldn't wait a week and i definitely wouldn't wait two weeks they're drying out a lot of them are probably going to die off and you're gonna you lose some of those bare roots most likely and I, I really don't know of a way that you can stall it. Um, not sure. Maybe Google it if there's something you could do. Maybe just keeping them kind of wet for a little bit. I, I don't know. I've never tried that. I am pretty quick about planting my strawberry bare roots. Are alpine strawberries covered in the class? Do you mean the ones that are white? Like those white strawberries? Um... I think that's what you mean. Let me know, please. Um, try Grand Teton Organic for potato seeds. Um, I have seen like Fedco seeds as well. Um, and Haas Tools. I know there's so many more that I've seen. Because um, I get emails, you know, from all these companies, you know, when they got stuff when it's time to do pre-orders. And I know I've been seeing a lot of emails starting to pop up with companies that are releasing their seed potatoes. Um, but those are the two that come to my mind. Yes, the mini ones. Um, I didn't mean mini, I meant white. Like I think the Alpine strawberries are the white or like the really light pink colored ones. Um, I didn't mention them specifically, but I did review all the differences between um, the categories of the cultivars because there's four different categories and depending on where you're located, uh, that's important to know because some categories grow better up north and other categories grow better down south. So if you're alpine strawberries, uh, where are you located? The white. Yeah, that's what I thought. The white ones that I see in the grocery store, um, they're really good. I've had them before. Where are you located, Jay? So, um, are you in the south? Are you in the north? Because um, that's going to help me answer. Oh, okay. You're in Texas. Okay. So, you're in the south. Um, the two categories of strawberries that you need to focus on, I don't know what category the alpine ones. In Houston, I used to live in Galveston for three years, actually. I used to drive up through Houston all the time. Um, and Galveston is 9B and I'm in Florida, also 9B, but they're not the same. It definitely got a little bit colder in, in Galveston um, than it ever has here in Florida. But anyways, um, back to the, just to answer your question, um, strawberries fall into four categories. You have June bearing, ever bearing, day neutral, and short day. And for if you're a Southern gardener growing strawberries during the fall, winter, and spring, Ideally, you want to buy day neutral or short day uh, uh, strawberry cultivars. I don't know what category the alpine one falls into. Um, I've never grown that one personally, but that'd be cool. I need to try that next year for sure. If they have one that is um, day neutral or short day, that's what you're looking for. What that basically means is that because uh, in the south we're growing um, ever bearing. Uh, no. <laughs> So there's four categories. June bearing and ever bearing are better for, or maybe you're telling me the alpine ones are ever bearing. Well, June bearing and ever bearing are best for northern gardeners because they start producing fruit when the daylight hours are longest. So that's summertime. And that's great for northern gardeners because they're planting and growing strawberries during the summer. But as southern gardeners, we're planting and growing strawberries the opposite time of the year, fall, winter, and spring when the daylight hours are shorter. So you want a cultivar that will still be triggered to flower and produce fruit with less daylight hours. So that's why I recommend day neutral or short day because they they don't require as much daylight hours as the uh, June bearing ever bearing. But I will say, I've had Florida gardeners tell me that they've 
grown an ever bearing or a june bearing before because they didn't know they just bought some planted it and it grew and it produced for them so you know it might work for you it might not um that's one thing with gardening like experiment i can't tell you how many times people have told me that doesn't grow here in florida like asparagus for example that doesn't grow here you know don't even try and i grow tons of asparagus and i've harvested tons of asparagus so experiment you never know maybe your microclimate of your own unique garden um will support it and be okay i mean it depends on so many different factors um but in general like i recommend um that you find a day neutral or short day type of strawberry there could be lots of different cultivars of of alpine strawberries you know there isn't just one i can guarantee you that there's probably different kinds and maybe you can find one that is a day neutral or short day type that's that's the key there or just buy it grow it and see what happens <laughs> and then let me know if it, if it worked out for you um i've had some people in florida tell me the albion um they've grown albion that they get from like amazon and it grew well for them and that's an ever bearing strawberry which typically means ever bearing means it will start producing in some in summer through fall like that that part of the year when the daylight hours are long but it worked for them so you know that's what i'm saying like just experiment see what happens if you have the space you know give it a try and see what happens most of the time i'm pleasantly surprised oh yes alpine are ever bearing but i had problems last year with them what were the problems <laughs> since now we know ever bearing um i'm curious to know did they not produce well for you did you just get lots of pests and diseases uh because i i want to try growing them thank you so much we're about to end the class here i'm um i'm done <laughs> i'm done with all my notes um, I do have a sale going on on my website, jarosgarden.com. It's 15% um, off automatically off from all seeds and plants. So take advantage. It ends the last day of this month of October. So it's like in two days. Um, you know, if you want to get the dates and times for my future classes and stuff like that, the best bet is to join my email group. Um, I will be sending a summary. Well, I guess if you're not part of the email group, you wouldn't get it this way. But um, this class will load up upload to my youtube channel immediately after we're done here and in the description i'll put a link to my email group so that you can join and get you know the dates and times and stuff like that um you know consistently or the fastest way to get them or find out about them um and then after this class i send a summary email and i'll throw in there all the you know supplies products uh cultivars stuff like that that i may have mentioned so that you guys can reference back to that stuff so be expecting that email very soon all right well that's it guys i hope you like this class i want to know how your strawberries and potatoes do so if you uh post anything on social media um you know instagram TikTok, youtube whatever and you can tag me please tag me i love to see like uh you know the results like all this stuff i do and teach um it's all so that you guys grow more food and nothing makes me happier than someone tagging me and I get to see like your harvest and stuff. It's um, makes me feel great. So if you ever grow any of my plants and seeds and stuff like that too, please let me know by tagging me. Um, they did well in my arrow garden, in my container outdoors garden. They never went past a, uh, a season. Oh, huh. That's, um, I would have expected them to do better outdoors, um, but you know, I don't know. If the soil is too compacted, then that, that's going to cause a lot of issues as well. But, um, all right, guys, uh, if you missed anything, this will be posted on my YouTube channel. And thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. I hope you guys learned a lot. Have a good rest of your day. Mm -hmm.